Kia ora koto. Welcome to Queering Games. I'm Dr. Tofekland, a lecturer in English and New Media Studies at Auckland University of Technology. I'm non-binary transgender. My pronouns are they, them. My talk today is about LGBTQ plus representation in games, including games by and for the queer community, and how those games queer or challenge our understanding of what games can and should be. I won't be talking about queer subtext in mainstream games today. It may be that Luigi is gay and that Link's sword is a phallus, but that's not our concern here. I want to start in the late 80s, not just for the proliferation of homophobic and transphobic content in games at that time, but because of C.M. Ralph's 1989 Caper in the Castro, the first known queer for queer video game. The protagonist of Caper is a butch lesbian searching for her best friend, a drag queen. Ralph released this game for free, asking only that players donate to AIDS relief, illustrating how queer games can literally be a matter of life and death. After Caper, there was a slow trickle of queer indie games over the 90s and aughts. Then the floodgates opened in 2012 with the release of Anna Anthropy's Dysphoria, Porpentine's Howling Dogs, and Christine Love's Analog, a hate story. These games all presented stories of gender nonconformity, alienage, and queer survival in broken worlds, a style I call gender punk. The following year, Zoe Quinn and her game, Depression Quest, would be the first targets of the Gamergate hate movement. The life and death stakes of queer games were never clearer than in the years of death, rape, and torture threats Quinn endured. In the past two years, indie games, by an increasingly diverse set of queer creators, have posed a genderpunk challenge to mainstream gaming's obsession with beating and owning games and players alike. In Mia Schwartz and AVB's Heaven Will Be Mine, queer pilots fight cinematic duels, but the player picks the winner. In Ryan Rose's Say and Heather Flower's Gender Wrecked, the player can talk to, fight, or kiss grotesque monsters but every option is a form of communication. In Flower's Extreme Meat Punks Forever, a group of gay disasters use fleshy, bioorganic robots to fend off fascists, but you can't kill your enemies. Instead, you have to push them out of the literal and metaphorical public arena. Over the same period, Porpentine and Ada Rook's no World Dreamers Sticky Zeitgeist featured a group of mutant and cyborg trans women living on an irrecoverably polluted trash world. Zoe Quinn and Chuck Tingle are collaborating on a forthcoming game in the vein of Tingle's gonzo gay erotic novel Pounded in the Butt by My Own Butt. And Kiwi led Skeleteam released Catacomb Prints about a reanimated skeleton search for love and his killer in a pansexually inclusive pseudo-Florentine setting where even the church recognizes gender diversity. You can, in various senses of the word, complete these games, but you can't really beat them. There's nothing in them opposed to the player and only an experience to be won. Contests of skill where they exist can be skipped, and bad endings are funny or reflective, not mocking. In an era of esports, leaderboards, integrated social media elements, and rampant disrespect for other players, these games are single player, small, offline experiences that nonetheless do more to cultivate a meaningful sense of connection and community than any first-person shooter or MMORPG. Thank you.